begin with verse 13. Let's, read, let's start with verse 12. I, the teacher, have been king over, over Israel and Jerusalem. I applied my mind to seek and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task to keep them occupied. I've seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. What is crooked, verse 15, what is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I've amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before me. And my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. I apply my mind to know wisdom and knowledge, madness and folly. I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind. For with much wisdom is much sorrow as knowledge increases, grief increases. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. I said to myself, go ahead. I will test you with pleasure. I will enjoy what is good. But it turned out to be futile. I said about, I said about laughter, it is madness. <laughs> and about pleasure, what does this accomplish? I explored with my mind how to let my body enjoy life with wine and how to grasp folly. My mind still guided me with wisdom until I could see what is good for people to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. Verse 4. I increased my achievements. I built houses. I planted vineyards for myself. I made gardens and parks for myself. I planted every kind of tree in them. I constructed reservoirs of water for myself from which to irrigate, irrigate a grove of flourishing trees. I acquired male and female servants and had slaves who were born in my house. I also owned many herds of cattle and flocks, more than all who were before me in Jerusalem. I also amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I gathered male and female singers for myself and many concubines, the delights of men. Thus I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. My wisdom also <coughs> remained with me. All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for all of my struggles. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything to be futile and a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the opportunity to share it today. I pray, Father, that you'll hide me down the cross of Calvary, and I pray, Lord, that you'll speak to our hearts today. May we, Father, be changed because we pass this way. And see your name we pray. Solomon had every opportunity, every opportunity possible in every facet of human life. He was not only <laughs> by far the richest man that ever lived, but he was also an absolute monarch, the king over a great empire. He was the king over every life and every province that was in his hands. And that's the reason this message is called a true hardware, a true value hardware store. Because he could buy anything that he wanted to buy. He could go anywhere he wanted to go. He could experience any depth or height or breadth of human life that he wanted to. And we begin this morning with what he says, what he avows. Having the ability and the open door opportunity to experience everything in existence, he starts off with the statement of dedication, I, that is, the king over Israel and Jerusalem, I set my heart. And then he names those things that he set his heart upon to experience. First of all, we see that he set his heart on wisdom. Wisdom is number one. In chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, I set my heart to seek and to search out my wisdom concerning everything that is done under heaven. The burdensome task God has given to the sons of men by which they may be exercised. He says, I've seen all the works that are done under the sun. What an amazing assessment. What an amazing assignment. What an amazing experience that we have as Solomon tries to find what is true. He says here that what God has left out, man can't put in. 
It is beyond our understanding. That's the amazing thing that, that we need to see, how limited we are in grasping of the truth of God. A pastor once quoted the most famous astronomical uh, scientist in the world. But yet, this scientist was an absolute infidel. He was, a, he was an atheist. But that infidel, that atheist, that great astronomical scientist, he was making fun of us when he says that there are billions of universes and billions of stars in those universes, and we believe that an old man with a long white beard sits up there somewhere and he made and controls all of this, all of this stuff, all these things. He, he controls them. And he sits up there and he laughs at all of us who believe in the Lord God. That is not what I want to know. You see, what I want to know is I want to know that there are universes out there. I, I want to know that there are billions of stars out there. I do want to know that there is a Milky Way and that there are beautiful places and beautiful planets out there. But what I want to know is where did it all come from? Who made it? What I want to know is where did I come from and who made me? Who made me sensitive to the reality of somebody I call God? Where did that come from in my soul? Where did that come from in my heart? What makes me hungry? What makes me want to seek after God? What, what makes me want to know more about the Lord God? And what makes me want to know more about heaven? What, what makes me want to live a holy life in this world? And that's what he says here. He found out that God did not, did not and, and cannot add to, or man cannot add to anything that God has done. When a man attempts, for example, to create, let's just say life, he can't do it. I mean, they're, they're trying in scientific circles. They're trying to do that, but, but they can't do it. Let's take, for instance, Christmas gardens. Anybody, any time you ever been to Christmas gardens in Gatlinburg? Beautiful place. If you've never been there, you need to go. The story of Christ portrayed through uh, life, 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 and wax. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, when you walk in and you see that first one, you think, wow, they got close. But they got a long ways to go. <coughs> oh yeah, they try to make them look realistic. They try to make them look like they're really <coughs> actually there. Here in the year 2012, from over two over two thousand years ago, here's Jesus standing at the seashore teaching, but it's not Jesus, it's a wax figure. Because you see, as much as they want to make it life like, it's still a wax figure. As much as they want to make it life like, it's still nothing more than the creation of human hands. When I seek the ultimate truth of God, I reach a horizon. When I come to that horizon, there's another horizon to go for. And when I cross that horizon, there's yet another. And then when I finally climb to the highest hills and I think that the stars are within my grasp, they're still way out there, way away from me. And that's what he says. He says it's a grasping of the wind. We can never ultimately understand. The great truth of God is beyond us. No matter how hard we go after wisdom, he says, number two, not only wisdom, I want after pleasure. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. He says, I set my heart to pleasure. Come now, I will test you and I will enjoy pleasure. But this also I found to be a vanity. He says, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from thee. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. Try to find the truth of the Almighty God trying to seek it now in pleasure. Does that not sound like a lot of people that live around us? Solomon loved many women. As the daughters of Pharaoh, he loved women of the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonites, the, the Hittites. It says that Solomon clung to these in love and he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Oh, I, I got one and that's more than enough for my heart. One is enough. 
I'm going to keep it that way. I'm not going to add anything to it. 700 wives. My goodness gracious. Can you imagine when he went home at night? And 300 concubines. No wonder he says that's a grass good of the wind. <laughs> and he says, I searched in my heart how to gratify my flesh, my flesh with wine and with liquor. It's an interesting comment of what he, what he says about drinking liquor. Wine, he says, is a mock. A strong drink is a brawl. And whoever is led thereby is not wise. He added also in the book of Proverbs, Woe has, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? I think he went to that door that you went to recently. Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. That's, that's exactly what we have down here at the Rockford Hill. Do not look upon the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. Look, at the last, it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. You see, that's what he found out as he tried pleasure and he tried happiness in wine and liquor. You know, I believe that it's the most ridiculous view of life that I've ever seen. I've lived through a number, probably more than I want to count for you this morning, of what they call wet dry referendums. You know, where they say, well, you know, this group of pro drinkers, pro alcohol folks, they, they get together and they get a petition up and, and, uh, and, and they take it and they get a bunch of dead folks, I mean a bunch of folks to sign it and uh, say that they're registered voters and, and uh, then they take it to the council or to the commission and they say, we want a wet dry referendum. And so the pro, the pro, alcohol the fights with those who are against it, the anti-alcohol group. And, but, but, but their reason and it's always this. It, it's, it's, now, now this is where the ridiculous part comes in. Their reason is always this. Let's have legalized sales so that, y'all heard this, so that we can have a better government, so that we can have better schools, so that we can have better financial means by which to serve our county citizens. We'll have better roads because of alcohol. We'll have better school buildings because of alcohol. We, if we'll put a store on every corner and, and, and we'll get everybody to drink it, then, then we'll be able to really service the people of our county. Uh, it's kind of the same backdoor, crazy, ridiculous reason as the gamblers. Gamblers say, you know, we won't legalize gambling so that so that we can uh, have better schools, so that we can have a better government, so that we can have better roads, so that we can have better police protection. So that, you know, they, they say all of that. But yet, when they get everybody gambling, they don't ever have enough because they want to do something else. They want to do more. A case in point is, recently in our legislature, they, they brought up this uh, new thing where they can have their brew clubs. Their, their, their brew clubs. You know, homemade or, or, or no, excuse me, uh, specialty type alcohol, legal, so that they can add to it because they they're not getting enough from legalized sales. They've got to add to it. You see, it's a ridiculous reason. Let's get everybody into drinking. Let's get everybody into partying. Let's get let's get everybody let's get everybody to addicted to alcohol. And then we'll be able to survive and we'll be able to take care of everybody. You see, the thing about it is they don't see the fallout. Huh? They don't see the fallout. If I were to ask some of the law enforcement people sitting here in this room today to stand up and give me a five-minute spill on the fallout of legalized alcohol, you and I would be crying for we left here. Because we see the sorrow. We see the love. We see the struggle. We see the hardships. Then he says, he says, I made, he said, I made my great works. I built myself houses. I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards. I planted fruit trees. I made myself water pools in which to water the growing trees. I acquired male and female servants. I had servants born in my house. Yea, I had a great, I had greater possessions than anybody who has ever lived. I gathered silver and gold and treasures. I acquired the male and female singers, the delights, the son of men, musical instruments of all kinds. 
And I became, I became great, and I excelled more than all those that were before me in Jerusalem. And I looked at all those things that I possessed, and all the great pleasures I had accomplished, and, and all that my hands had done, and, and, and all the labor in which I had told, and it was vanity, it was grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Isn't that the most amazing thing we've ever heard? Isn't, isn't it amazing? I copied Joseph, Josephus. He's that great historian. And, and he says, this is Solomon going out early in the morning from Jerusalem to the famed rocks of Edom, a fertile region, delightful with paradises and running springs. Thither the king in robes of white robe, of white robe in his chariot, escorted by a troop of bounded archers, chosen for their youth and stature, and clad in Tyrrhenian purple, whose long hair powdered with gold dust sparkled in the sun. Sounds like a rich man, doesn't it? Sounds like a wealthy man looking for pleasure in all the wrong places. Can you imagine what a king he was, though? What a glory he had. There's Solomon. He owns the earth. The queen of Sheba came to him and she said, she saw all that he had. She saw his great library. She saw his great wonders. She saw his good buildings. She saw his architecture. She saw his art collection. And she said, surely the half had not been told. There's even more marvelous than anything on the earth that she had ever seen. Then he built all of these great public buildings and when he had possessed everything the human heart and the hand could achieve, he said, it is vanity. It's a grasping of the wind. Isn't that amazing? Envy a man like that? Envy a king like that? A homeless man walking down Madison Avenue and Montgomery looks in, uh, looks on the inside of, the win of a window and he sees there a rich man dressed in his finest clothes. And he says to himself, if not out loud, the homeless man says, oh, I wish I was like him. He's got it all. He's rich and he's wealthy, sitting there in his room drinking his coat. I can't say brandy because we just talked about drinking, okay? Drinking his coat. Sitting there by that fire, warm, well fed. What he doesn't know is that man's contemplating suicide. One of the great men of all times, the inventor Eastman, he, he invented the coat. Remember that? He's one of the most famous inventors in the world and one of the richest men of the earth at his time. How did he die? And, and that's amazing, isn't it? Because we think that a, that a man like that, possessing everything, having everything that he could acquire, would live and live and live. Solomon says having it all, it was vanity, it was a grasping of the wind. I read about Andrew Carnegie and, he, and when he died. They say that he had great witches riches. They said that he had grand things that he was surrounded by. At that day that Andrew Carnegie died, there was a boy, a street urchin, selling papers on the street. And the headline was, Carnegie had died. And that boy said, I'm richer than Andrew, Andrew Carnegie today. Because he's dead, not alive. It's hard to get joy and pleasure out of possessions. That's what he says. Here's the third thing. He talks about the gratitude of life. Look back at chapter 1 and verse 4. Chapter 1 and verse 4 reads simply, one generation passes away, another generation comes just like that, and only the earth abides forever. <laughs> Isn't that the whole truth? Life is so short. We see lives cut short constantly. Some by stupidity, others by some disease. Still others by their own hands. Life is so short. We think back to 9 11, we think back to all those men and women who were in the towers that day when, when the violence came in. And we wonder did any of them think that this would be the last day of their life? We go about our business and we go about our things and we do what we want to and we wonder, could this be our last day? There is no pleasure because life is so short. 
He says one generation passes away, another generation comes, just like that. It's amazing to me how we so often put our stock in what we have here, right now. And we lay our claim to it. And we forget about eternity. We say that teenagers, particularly, feel like they'll live forever. But some of us live like we'll live forever right here on this earth. Because we do things to try to make it long. Like both times. Thanks. Other things. The list could go on. Because we want to be young. We want to live. We want to stay. But life is short. There's funerals and there's death calls. There's dying and there's living and death. Life is so brief. Martin Luther was walking down the street with one of his friends, his best friend, died. Struck by lightning. He died right there on the spot. Martin Luther began his search for God. Oh God, how we need Thee at this inevitable path that leads to the dust and to the grave. That's what, that's what Solomon found in the brevity of life. There's one more thing. There's number four. There's the Look back to chapter 6. Or look over at chapter 6 and verse 1. He learned and he said that, that life is never to be confused with things. And so he writes it like this. There is an evil, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun common among men. A man to whom God has given riches and wealth and honor so that he lacks nothing for himself in all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to leave him. Wow. Can, can, can you imagine that? God's given to that man riches. He's given to him wealth. He's given to him honor. He lacks nothing at all that he does eat of it. God gives wealth. God gives riches and He doesn't give them the power to be. Isn't that a sign? Man, I could surely enjoy it. But oh, it's a vanity to the flesh. If a man... Now look at verse 3, chapter 6. If a man begat a hundred children and lives many years, so that the days of the years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with good, as I say that a stillborn child is better than he. For that stillborn child comes and departs in darkness. Though it has not seen the sun nor known anything, this hath more rest than that man. Even if he lives a thousand years twice, but has not seen goodness. Isn't that amazing? This, this is Solomon who said that a stillborn child is better off than a man of the world whose life is consumed with things and he gives his life to the acquisition of all these things, and then he names them. Isn't that what our Lord calls us? The rich man said, look, I'm a priest. My fields are plentiful. They're abounding in harvest. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build greater ones. And that night, says the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, God comes, knocks on the door, and says, this night, this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be that you have acquired? What can he say? Somebody else is going to get them. Somebody else is going to have it. It's just like everything else that you acquire. Somebody else is going to get it. Right now the government's trying to get it off. But somebody's going to get it. Somebody's going to have it. Somebody's going to soon possess everything that you have. Then, then Paul wrote to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. He says this is what's important. Godliness with contentment is gain. We brought nothing into this world. We take nothing out. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I read a story of a man who would die. It wouldn't be long for him. <laughs> but as he got there in the bed, his wife observed that he continued to look at his hands. He continued to look at his hands. 
And this really distressed his wife. She just couldn't understand. He wouldn't eat. He wouldn't drink. He just looked at his hand. And so she called his best friend and she said, Look, you've been his best friend for, best friend for years. He's laying here. He's looking at his hands and I have no idea what to do with him. Would you come and talk to him, please? He won't eat. He won't drink. He just lays there. Tears running out of his eyes, looking at his hands. He said, Sure, I'll come over. Within a few minutes, he's over there. He comes over. He sits down on the side of the bed. And yes, the man was looking at his hands. Tears running down his own cheeks. He says, Look, your wife's upset. And now you're upset. What's going on? The man looked at him. And he said, Jim, look at my hands. They're so easy. That's life for those who give themselves. Your hands are always going to be I want to take the time to end today. I want to, I want to end with something written by Robert J. Hastings. It's entitled The Station. Listen. Tucked away in our unconscious minds is an idea of vision. We see ourselves on a long, long trip that almost spans the continent. We're traveling by passenger train. And out the windows we drink in the passing scenes of cars on highways, children waving at the crossings, cattle grazing on the distant hill, row upon row of corn and wheat, flatlands, valleys, mountains, hills, city skylines, villages. But uttermost in our minds is the final destination. On a certain day, at a certain hour, we'll pull into the station, and there will be bands playing and flags waving. And once we get there, so many wonderful dreams will come true. So many wishes will be fulfilled. And so many pieces of our lives will finally be put together. How restless we pace the aisles, waiting, waiting, waiting for that final destination, the station. Sooner or later, we must realize there is no one station, no one place to arrive at once and for all. The station is only a dream, but constantly, Distance. When we reach the station, that will be it. That's what we promise. And translated, that means when I'm 18, <coughs> that will be it. Everything will fall into place. Or when the last kid is put to, through college. Or when I have everything that I want. Or when the mortgage is paid off. Or when I reach the age of retirement. Or I shall live happily ever after when, and you feel it. Unfortunately, when we get it, it disappears. Unfortunately, the station somehow hides itself at the end of an endless journey. Because if we put our hope in everything that's here in our hands, we're going to have nothing. But if we put our hope in what we have stored here in our heart, then my friends, you have a true value hardware store. Because Jesus said himself that we need to put our treasures not here, but up there. That we need to build our lives here for what's over there. I said it before, I'll say it again, and you'll hear me say it again and again. We're living in our dress rehearsal stage because one day we're going to be on the big stage with the Lord Jesus Christ Himself in all of eternity. And what we do here will matter there because we're laying up treasures there, not here on this earth. So my friend, I encourage you today to let Jesus Christ give you wisdom and strength in your heart, understanding and help, and let Him fill your hands with hope for over the other for Him on that side, and lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust doth corrupt, doth not corrupt, and where thieves